Good day, everyone, and welcome to the UDEP Council Virtual Roundtable Conference Call. Today's conference is being recorded. At this time, I'd like to turn the conference over to Mr. Marty Bishop. Please go ahead, sir. Thank you, Shalon. Uh, all right, everybody, let's uh, let's get started. Uh, thanks for joining me today for the first uh, virtual roundtable meeting of the UDAP Council. I know a lot of you on the call, but for those of you I don't know yet, uh, I'm Marty Bishop. I'm a partner in Foley's uh, Foley and Lardner Chicago office. I co-chair our consumer financial services practice and am the vice chair of uh, Foley's litigation department. I've represented consumer financial institutions over the course of my entire career and have been following with keen interest the development of UDAP since its introduction into draft Dodd-Frank legislation. I'm a somewhat outspoken critic of UDAP's vagaries, but find myself nonetheless committed to developing the solution, uh, solutions to what I think is a vexing and long-term problem for the consumer financial services industry as a whole. It's a little bit about me. I think it's probably important for you to know a little bit about you, the, the folks who are attending today. As you know, so far, participation in the UDAP Council has been uh, basically by invitation, and we had about 100 individuals sign up for this roundtable. Uh, some uh, people we invited weren't able to make it today. Those people in attendance represent about 70 different covered persons and service providers under Title X of the Dodd-Frank Act. All of you were invited, and I suspect, suspect all of you are actually here because of your and your institution's concerns about UDAP. Included among us are uh, banks of all sizes, credit unions, student lenders, mortgage lenders, credit card companies, prepaids, mortgage servicers, uh, credit reporting agencies, tax preparation services, and a variety of other entities that are subject to Dodd -Frank, the Dodd-Frank Act's prohibition of uh, unfair, deceptive, or abusive acts or practices. Importantly, enterprises are represented here today across responsibility lines. We have lawyers, compliance professionals, business folks, and even some executives on the line with us. And this is, at least in my opinion, how it should be, how it really must be. If we're going to do something about UDAP, it has to be driven at a level that transcends product lines and professional disciplines. UDAP is a problem that we must attack collectively if we're going to make any real progress here. So let me kick this off uh, by letting you know what ground we're going to cover today. In terms of the agenda, I'm going to talk for about 20 minutes to set the stage for what I hope will be a robust, collaborative, and fruitful discussion about where we can take this thing. To get there, I'll lay out the case for why this council is necessary, talk a little bit about what we know about the state and direction of UDAP, identify some of the things that we can talk about and do about it, sketch out a path for getting us there, and then open the lines uh, for a discussion. Uh, I want you to note that all the phone lines, other than mine for the moment, are muted. I'll give you some further instructions about joining the conversation toward the tail end of, uh, of my discussion. Uh, although the call is scheduled for an hour, I want you to know that the council values your time. We'll stay on the line only as long as we need to today. Uh, in short, today is really the first step in, in setting our agenda as a group, and I would expect that future get-togethers will become more and more uh, substantive over time. So how do we get here? Uh, well, as you all probably know all too well, in the wake of the 2008 financial crisis, the regulatory regime for the consumer financial services industry has undergone a big change. We've had, we have a big new statute in the Dodd-Frank Act and a powerful new regulator in the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Since you're here, it's likely that you also know that uh, the Dodd-Frank Act specifically authorizes the Bureau to prevent any covered person or service provider from engaging in an unfair, deceptive, or abusive act or practice in connection with any transaction with a consumer for a consumer financial product or service or the offering of a consumer financial product or service. That's the all language that comes straight out of the Act. And this UDAP provision is a central component of the Bureau's three-part vision of a better consumer financial marketplace. Sandwiched right there between transparency and a well-working uh, marketplace is the Bureau's vision of a consumer financial marketplace 
free from UDAP. So of all the things the Bureau has to grapple with, all the regulations it has to develop, all the institutions it has to supervise, all the products it has to regulate, all the consumer finance statutes it has to oversee, the Bureau has gone out of its way to tell us that a full one-third of its overall vision, a vision, uh, by the way, that is very well funded off the federal government's overall budget, a full one-third of its vision relates to UDAP. And so there's, in my opinion, little room for debate about how important will be, uh, how important UDAP will be in the coming years. And it's hard to argue against, you know, such a virtuous vision, right? No one on this call would argue that the consumer financial marketplace should include unfair or deceptive acts or practices, and we don't want that. Uh, we don't want underhanded practices undermining the market in which we operate, but, but, but all this does is beg the questions of what is an unfair practice, what is an abusive act, what constitutes deception, and the Bureau has told us precious little about that. So what do we know? We know a few things, and when I say no, by the way, I mean no, uh, not something we're guessing about, and when I say a few, I really mean a precious few things. First, we know that each of the UDAP standards, unfairness, deception, and abusive, has a definition. The Dodd-Frank Act defines unfairness and abusive. De deception wasn't defined by the Act, but the Bureau has instructed us that it intends to use the traditional FTC Act definition of that term. You can find that defi definition in the Bureau's supervision manual. But I want to point out right here that though that uh, – the Bureau has given itself a lot of wiggle room with that manual. On the front page of version 2 of the manual, the Bureau states that the manual doesn't bind the Bureau and it shouldn't be relied on as, quote, legal reference, close quote. This gives me pause and it should give you pause as well. What that says to me is that the Bureau isn't going to be bound by anything it says in that manual, in that very long tome uh, volume. So don't rely on it, the Bureau tells us. Second, we know that the Bureau has laid out certain examples of acts that it believes are unfair and deceptive. They include unfair practices such as refusing to release a lien after a consumer makes her final payment on a mortgage and dishonoring credit card convenience checks without notice, and some deceptive acts or practices such as inadequate disclosures of material lease terms in television advertising or misrepresenting loan terms. Well, it's nice to have examples, and you sure don't want to be caught in any of these practices. Uh, they are ver a very limited utility in terms of achieving compliance with UDAP for most of us. They come from a different era, the pre-Dodd-Frank, pre-Bureau era, and importantly, these examples don't tell much to the folks at the CRAs or the prepaid companies or lots of other companies because the conduct that's at issue is discernibly different from the conduct that lots of folks are engaging in in the industry overall. Third, we still know very little about abusive. The Bureau, quite tellingly, has not provided any examples of practices it believes are abusive, and the Bureau has essentially publicly admitted that it doesn't intend to give us more guidance on the term, at least not in the foreseeable future. Director Cordray has said publicly that abusive is something the Bureau is going to have to measure on a facts and circumstances basis as it goes, which is a pretty scary notion uh, for all of us, I think. Fourth, uh, despite what I believe is a real lack of useful guidance from the Bureau on the acts or practices that it considers or may consider as violating UDAP, the Bureau is moving forward with UDAP enforcement actions. Over the summer, we saw the settlement of three actions against credit card companies, two involving add-on products and the other involving more general marketing practices. And knowing that the Bureau considers the practices identified in those actions as deceptive, which is what was at issue there, is helpful, particularly if you're a credit card company. But as you move away from the products and the practices at issue in each of those actions, there aren't huge takeaways for the rest of us. Importantly, the enforcement actions highlight the huge risk hanging over consumer financial services companies at the moment. That risk is that... Without real warning or guidance, you may find yourself staring down the barrel of an enforcement action. These, and a dangerous one, these, these three settlement, uh, actions, these three settlements alone resulted in about, uh, $525 million in restitution, refunds, and penalties. 
fifth, uh, the Bureau is actively collaborating with other agencies, making a kind of super UDAP agency focused on these UDAP activities. The most recent example is the Bureau joining with the FTC and conducting a sweep of 800 randomly selected ads for mortgage loans, refis, and reverse mortgages. That sweep has led to formal investigations of at least six companies and the issuance of dozens of warning letters. For the the uh, the Discover credit card enforcement case, the Bureau joined an investigation started by the FDIC, and similarly, in the Amex enforcement action, the Bureau joined the FDIC, the Fed, the OCC, and the Utah Department of Financial Institutions. Putting all these agencies together to focus on UDAP is to direct some real firepower at these issues. Six, uh, the regulatory penalties for violating UDAP are severe. Knowing UDAP violations can result in a civil penalty of up to a million dollars for each day the violation occurs. Reckless violations can cost you up to $25,000 per day. And finally, the risk threat from UDAP goes beyond compliance risks and regulatory risks. There's a very real threat of extended, invasive, and expensive civil litigation. We're already starting to see litigation develop as a result of the credit card settlements over the summer. Each of those companies is now facing derivative shareholder suits as a result of the conduct targeted by the Bureau and its enforcement actions, and that will not be the end of it. Uh, there are plaintiff's firms out there actively trolling the Internet and recruiting plaintiffs to sign on to these and other types of potentially big-dollar, high-stakes UDAP cases. It's just a matter of time before we see the proliferation of lawsuits taking conduct identified by the Bureau in the UDAP context and extrapolating it to other companies in the industry. If we leave it unchecked, it'll be like a plague uh, upon the whole entire industry. So I don't think any of that stuff is, you know, new or earth-shattering news. My observation is that there's a general consensus from our side of the industry that the lack of clarity is, is vexing for us. There may be some debate about how intense the lack of clarity is, but there's little debate, uh, as far as I can tell, about whether more clarity would help the job of complying with UDAP and managing the risks UDAP poses. So what can we do about it? Uh, well, I think we've taken the first step here in order to make an impact and change the direction of where UDAP laws are headed. We need to unite the covered persons and service providers, all of you on this call, and start collaborating on common issues. The fact is that no matter what you do, whether you're a bank, a CRA, a mortgage servicer, a prepaid credit card company, a traditional credit card company, you have no real idea where the contours of abusive lie. You have no idea where the edges of unfairness and deception lie either. And I think we're entitled to know quite a bit more about that. So getting us all together, legal, compliance, business, and getting us together across industry lines in, in one place, I think is a great start. So what do we want to tackle now that we're here? Our, I think our group conscious will ultimately determine our agenda, but there are a few things that I've picked up in my travels and discussions and interactions uh, along the way that I know we're more than capable of, of addressing as a collective. And the possibilities are endless, uh, but let me note a few things before I open up the lines for um, some discussion. First, we can use this venue uh, to talk about our UDAP experiences. We can use the council to share our experiences with the Bureau and all the regulators. And, you know, while the Bureau talks a good transparency game, it's way short on details when it comes to what it's actually doing in the field regarding UDAP. We can also share what we've encountered there. We can share what uh, we've encountered in our institutions, and we can vet, uh, to some degree, products and practices. Second, we can collaborate across the industry on best practices to identify and, and avoid UDAP. I think this will give each of your organizations a perspective that it's never had before, and in turn, I think we can exponentially grow our collective U, UDAP uh, knowledge base. Third, uh, we can broadly monitor developments in UDAP and disseminate that information to our members. The tendency lately has been to focus almost exclusively on what has been going on with Dodd-Frank UDAP, but as we know, UDAP with two A's is 
derived from UDAP with 1A. There's still quite a bit of activity going on out there under the FTC Act and the various mini FTC Acts of the various states. Regulators and plaintiffs' lawyers are pushing the limit, the, uh, the limits of UDAP, and wouldn't it be nice if you had a resource that regularly monitored developments for you? I think the importance of this particular responsibility of the council will continue to grow over time as we see plaintiffs' attorneys taking the fact patterns laid out by the Bureau enforcement actions and settlements and extrapolating them to other consumer financial com uh, companies and service providers. Fourth, uh, and as a consequence of the first three items uh, I just mentioned, we can set up the gold standard for UDAP uh, or UDAP compliance. What do I mean by that? Well, one of the goals or one of the expected byproducts of the UDAP Council is to demonstrate to regulators and the public at large that the consumer financial service industry as a whole, at least those who are members of this council, are committed to avoiding UDAP. I think we can develop a set of outward-facing standards and pronouncements that will help on the public relations front of the UDAP war. Fifth, we can take our collective concerns directly to the Bureau's top leadership and the leadership of other regulators that are using UDAP as an enforcement tool. We can push the Bureau to be truly transparent about what it's doing with UDAP. We can press the Bureau to delineate the contours of the UDAP standards. We can ask the Bureau to develop with us an open line of communication on these issues. There's a lot we can do here to leverage the power of a collective that includes membership from every corner of the consumer financial services industry. Sixth, where appropriate, meaning at the federal or the state level, we can propose legislative and regulatory changes that help clarify UDAP laws for our industry. With such vague legislative standards and a complete void of regulation, I see a lot of opportunity to advance a regulatory and legislative agenda and to make the landscape here better for all of us. Seventh, we can and will uh, have regular meetings to discuss all of these things. I know that web conferences are not ideal, but given what I think will be the ultimate size of this group and the geographic dispersion of members across the country to really move the needle, uh, I think web conferencing is, our, is probably our best tool. And finally, uh, we can and should have an annual live conference. Well, obviously, there's no agenda set for that meeting at the moment. The vision would be to have a top bureau official or number of officials present a keynote address, have learning sessions on the UDAP standards, and develop a panel of regulators, attorneys general, uh, consumer advocates, plaintiff's attorneys, essentially the UDAP enforcers, uh, who will be able to give us all some insight into what they think the hottest UDAP issues are of the moment, and I, I would like to have us shoot for a conference no later than this coming fall, which I think is is pretty doable. So how do we accomplish all that? Uh, well, we can do it. I'm confident of that. I know because I've talked to a lot of you face-to-face. -face. What I've observed is that there's a deep commitment here to tackling and resolving these issues, to making the marketplace easier to operate in under these laws. To do it, I think we need to establish some ad hoc committees populated by us and, and future invitees. I don't think this requires a huge time commitment, just really a discrete committee-level discussion about what to do and where to go. I also want to emphasize here that you know your participation on committees is not mandatory. It's really uh, up to you to make the decision about your level of participation. And here, I just want to give you a heads up. I'm going to open up the phone lines in just a minute to discuss the various council agenda items I've been discussing here and give all of you the opportunity to identify other items or issues that we haven't talked about yet. So get ready with your questions. If you want to be in the queue, just dial star one and we'll be able to come back. I'll be able to come back to you uh, as soon as I wrap up, which will be uh, in just a minute. But first, I'd like to lay out the basics for about six separate committees I think uh, will help us get started on all of this. First is a steering committee, uh, which will help us guide the council on setting priorities and managing the general course of the council's operation. Next is a membership committee, which can address issues like types of memberships we should offer, who will qualify for those memberships, and what we need to charge to achieve our goals. 
Third is uh, a standards committee. This is the committee that will consider some general best practices and assist the council in establishing that gold standard uh, for avoiding UDAP. Fourth is a regulatory and legislative committee, which will develop uh, a strategy to achieve some of the council's goals through regulatory and legislative changes. Fifth, uh, the fifth proposed committee is technologies and solutions, which I foresee as a collaboration between some of the premier vendors out there that are actively developing solutions to manage and mitigate UDAP risks and the members of the council. And finally, I think we would need an annual conference committee, which can uh, work to put together our annual conference. So uh, I'm going to take a breath. That's about it for me in terms of presentation. I'm going to open up the lines now and start the discussion part of the program. Uh, so to get in the queue again, you just hit uh, star one. And uh, maybe we can open this up and see if anyone has any thoughts about what uh, what we might have missed here or other items that uh, belong on the agenda. I see there's a – Mike has uh, uh, raised his hand, uh, so to speak. So, Shulan, if you could open Mike's line and let's hear what Mike has to say. Hi. Um, I'm sorry I joined the call late. I had a delay in some travel plans, but um, so I didn't hear all of this. But – I'm wondering if this is uh, your, what your vision is with respect to this as being something that eventually is like a financial services roundtable kind of thing where, um, you know, it's an industry-driven uh, council. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Yeah, that's exactly what, what this is. I think the industry sets the agenda, and, you know, we work together um, to advance the agenda of the council, uh, and that, you know, ultimately this, uh, will be an institution that stands on its own and has, uh, some, uh, longevity to it. Uh, I don't see UDAP going away anytime soon, but I do think we can push the industry, um, uh, push the regulators to, to make some, uh, changes here to make it better for us, make it easier to comply, lower the risk associated with managing the vague and amorphous standards that uh, we're dealing with here. So would it eventually have a, a, a leadership stru structure from industry in some way, or is that the thought, or what do you think? Yep, that's, a, that's precisely the thought, yep. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Don has raised his uh, hand through the ether here. Yes, hi. Um, the title UDAP with the two A's I, to me implied a focus on the Dodd-Frank Act and the Bureau, and obviously there are spillovers and things we need to keep track of in the state. Um, do you see this as covering both or focusing primarily on uh, – the Dodd-Frank version? I think for now the primary focus will be on the Dodd-Frank version because I think that's the newest, what the, the, the standards that we know the least about and how our regulators uh, are going to handle it. Um, but my personal view is that UDAP with two A's now encompasses everything. I think as institutions, institutions have to look across the 50 states and across the FTC Act and across the Dodd-Frank Act to see how the various regulatory and enforcement agencies are um, are dealing with UDAP. And I think it ultimately is going to become one big collective body of law and compliance tools that we'll have to deal with. Okay, thanks. Thanks for the question, Don. Uh, LaToya. Hi. Hi, um, I just was listening to your conversation. I'm wondering where do the other trade groups kind of fit in with this, like the ABA? I know they have several working groups, and, and what kind of relationship is there going to be between maybe the trade groups and your group, the council? So the, there are – thanks for the question, LaToya. There are trade groups, um, representatives from some trade groups on the line, um, and – my personal view is that 
you know, that we should be all inclusive about that. Um, the the reason why I think this is, the UDAP Council is important and, and can accomplish maybe a bit more um, than the ABA can on its own is because we're trying to appeal, and I think so far successfully, to the entire industry as opposed to just bankers uh, because it's not just bankers that are dealing with the issue. It's not just credit card companies that are dealing with the issue. It's not just mortgage servicers. We're all dealing with that. And the idea here, there's no, as you know, as far as I know, there's no organization out there that can bring the whole design to bring the whole industry together to tackle the issue. So very open to input from those other associations, and I hope some of them are here today. Um, and uh, I would anticipate collaborating with as many of them as want to be involved on a going forward basis. And I, I would hope uh, and welcome any discussion or thoughts anybody might have on that. But the idea is to try and get everybody together in the same place uh, to push what I think is really common goals forward. Thank you. Virginia. Yes. Yes. Um, I, to your point of that hopefully this can bring together a lot of different industries. I'm from a consumer reporting agency and just completed the ABA uh, certification training on UDAP. And it was very um, – a lot of it was specific to the banking industry. So uh, this whole UDAP is new to us because now we're under the um, – regulatory authority of the CFPB, and uh, and now we need to incorporate UDAP into uh, our compliance program. So I would be interested in um, maybe sharing some information or having the um, investment, the financial industry, share some of their thoughts on how UDAP gets incorporated into a compliance program, um, particularly given that it's so vague. I mean, that's, that, you know, I think I don't remember which one of the goals I it, it was, but it was an early one, is so we can get together and collaborate on this stuff because there's lots of um, actors in this industry that UDAP is relatively new to, certainly from right. w w under a lens like it's at now. But on the other end of the spectrum, we're, we're seeing activity directed at CRAs and lots of other folks that, in the and it you know it happens in the shadows uh, a lot of it and isn't out in the in the public domain at all and and to go so the information can go the other way when you're subject to a CID or some investigation by the bureau and we can take that information and share it in a sanitized way with the group to understand what's going on collectively I think um, that ultimately everybody will benefit from a two-way street there in terms of information sharing. Yeah, and I, th I think um, particularly given the CFPB so being so um, strong right now, um, that that's a good area to share information as well because I, I know that we have shared some information with some of our financial institutions and they've shared information back regarding CFPB interests, and it's been real helpful. Great. Thank you, Virginia. Uh, Lynette. Hi there. Um, hi there. I was just wondering if there's any particular media strategy that's been considered or will be considered to give, um, you know, a fair amount of visibility and, and create further support and inertia for the efforts of this group. Uh, there has been, I would say, preliminary consideration to that. I think, I, I, I think that's something we have to enter to do thoughtfully. Um, I, I see the opportunity for this group to, to really stand out as um, a, a vehicle for members to get behind and say, you know, we're we're proud of our efforts to try and avoid uh, engaging in. UDAP practices and trying to publicize that and, and setting up, you know, these gold standards or whatever we end up calling them to uh, have an outward facing um, PR campaign essentially to 
the consumers directly, but also I think that may have an impact on the Bureau. Um, so preliminary thoughts, I think that's something in committee that needs to be resolved and, and maybe brought before the group um, to ultimately decide. But I think that is a very important piece of what this group could be capable of. Did you have uh, yeah. other specific thoughts, Lynette? Well, I just I just think there's a tremendous potential benefit to communicating industry's commitment to this type of thinking in the face of all of the thinking in the in the country right now with respect to how consumers are being damaged. I mean, it, you, you know that there's this propensity um, collectively to think that industry is up to no good, and I think the more that we can do to educate and overturn some of that thinking, it, it would be, benefit industry, it would benefit consumers, it would benefit the entire country and the housing industry. Yeah, wholeheartedly agree. Yeah, okay. So I just I just wanted to um, hear a little bit about that, so thank you. Thank you, Lena. Uh, no one else is in the queue at the moment. Does uh, anybody else want to hit star one and join the discussion? Give it just to give you folks just a couple of seconds to raise your hand, so to speak. And uh, if no one does, I'll I'll try and wrap it up real quick for us. Okay. Uh, Hearing no more uh, hands go up, uh, I want to thank you for, for joining. The next step is I'll follow up uh, with an email uh, soliciting you to join one or more of the committees that you might uh, want to be involved in. And I would encourage you, you know, nothing formal, if you have uh, comments or thoughts about the way this is laid out today or other ideas that we might uh, address or tackle um, agenda items that the UDAP Council might be able to um, to address on a going forward basis. I encourage you to respond to my email and uh, and forward those, and I'll put add those to the agenda. And you know, sometime after the holidays, uh, we'll plan on getting back together again, and just for updating purposes, and we'll carry this thing forward and try and uh, accomplish what we've laid out here. So with that, I'll sign off and wish you all happy holidays and uh, look forward to working with all of you on this going forward. Thanks a lot for attending today and giving us your time. Appreciate it. That concludes today's conference. Thank you for your participation.